Okay, I should get started, folks. Um, now, uh, since uh, GPS works just by our ground receiver listening to satellite broadcasts, uh, we need to know more about what the satellites are actually broadcasting. And um, first of all, there's uh, uh, two carrier frequencies used by GPS. One's at uh, 1.2, uh, gigahertz and the other ones at uh, almost 1.6 gigahertz, uh, L1 and L2. And um, uh, now uh, on those carrier frequencies, what we get is not like an AM radio broadcast. It's not like an FM radio broadcast. It's not the kind of single signal you see going over uh, landline telephones. It's uh, much more complicated than that. And in fact, um, it's uh, very much using the, uh, uh, the pseudocode technology that um, uh, gets used by Wi-Fi, by uh, spread spectrum radio, uh, and, and all other kinds of internet radio. Um, it's not used by uh, ethernet. Um, uh, it's not, so it's not, um, it's not the kind of signal that's flowing through uh, your your uh, cable or uh, your TV cable or undersea cables or um, uh, the uh, fiber optic cables uh, that are that are uh, under um, under the street. Uh, it's the same as used by cell phones and Wi-Fi and and uh, uh, these kinds of um, you know broadly available radio broadcasts. So um, you take a, what they do is they take a uh, uh, a piece of data, such as the time at the satellite, and it gets uh, coded into a much longer pseudo-random code uh, by a, a, a binary multiplication. So, um, you know, one, um, you know, one course acquisition code, which is on the L1 frequency, has 1023 um, pseudo-random codes at a bit rate of one megahertz. So, you know, by that, by today's standards, not all that fast of a transmission. Um, using repeated long pseudorandom codes, what happens is that GPS signals can be very low power and you can still pick it up with your antenna and your cell phone, your GPS antenna and your cell phone, which is just a few centimeters across. It's a, just a piece of foil. Um, these and uh, uh, this is the same with uh, Wi-Fi and uh, other uh, these other kinds of um, uh, you know special transmissions. What's amazing is that the GPS satellites, which are a minimum of 400 kilometers uh, straight above you, um, and usually you know when they're down near the horizon, they can be thousands of kilometers away. Uh, they're only transmitting at um, at at uh, 50 watts, that's it. Uh, yet you can see that see it with a GPS receiver uh, as long as you can see that you have line of sight to the satellite. So that's what these pseudo random codes do for you, and that's why uh, we can have Wi-Fi and cell phones that have any reach at all. Hey, Dr. Louis, in that previous slide, that 1023 that you mentioned, what's yeah. what what is that? Uh... So that's a um, uh, that's the number of, uh, of codes, um, you know, uh, I think there's in a pseudo, in a course acquisition code, which includes the time and some information about the, uh, uh, the satellite, there's um, uh, 1023 bits, and then those get expanded into uh, pseudo random codes that are like a thousand times longer on the uh, carrier frequencies. Okay. But the pseudo random code code uh, each satellite is going to have its unique its own unique random code. Yeah. So right? so you take the piece of information and you multiply it by uh, a predetermined sequence of random numbers, and they probably also multiply it by numbers like the serial number of the satellite, um, and uh, and so it, it's a pseudo random code. It looks quite random, but it's predictable. And in particular, each satellite has its own particular code that looks random, but. Right, right. There's a sequence of random numbers that's predetermined. Okay. 
that it's using to encode um, these um, uh, the, the, the information that the satellite's broadcasting. Okay, thank you. Um, and so, but the, the fact that it's predictable is crucial because once your, your receiver, and this is why, um, you know, it wasn't until about year 2000 that GPS receivers got to be affordable. Um, your receiver has to have enough computational power to generate a replica a series of pseudo random codes to ge generate a replica of what it should be receiving from each of the maybe 32 satellites that you're looking at. And it has to be able to do that, um, you know, all in parallel. So that's, uh, you know, that's more than, a, um, uh, you know, than a, than a radio needs to do. And that's why, you know, we had to wait till cell phones were pretty powerful before we could get uh, uh, GPS receivers in them. And our GPS receivers are going to have those codes like preloaded. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, they know the uh, they know the sequence at least on the L one for the course acquisition code. Mm -hmm. um, for the uh, military uh, precise code, the the P code, uh, they don't know them. Um, and so, uh, and the precise code is on L two, so it it would be more accurate if we could get it. Um, so yeah, that's why it takes. Um, uh, you know, often with your cell phone, it can take uh, uh, half a minute to a minute to lock on to several satellites. And that means your, your receiver is successfully um, generating the correct codes. Uh, it's made a good enough guess about where it is and what codes, what satellites it can see and what their serial numbers are and what their orbits are. And it's able to, uh, to generate a... Um, a replica signal for each of those satellites uh, by knowing the time, you know, knowing something, uh, taking a good guess at the time the satellites uh, 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 gener uh, 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 generating, and then it's it's going to be basically get the received signal, okay, and it's going to be uh, taking the time um, and uh, generating its own rec replica signal, and it can match those across. Okay, so um, through a process called correlation. And uh, it's that correlation that really gives uh, GPS its uh, signal strength. Um, and so it's kind of an amazing thing that just by getting a GPS location, these correlators are running in your GPS chipset that are, uh, you know, correlating uh, uh, 20 or more satellites all at once. And generating a pseudo a different pseudo random code for each one. Um, so that's uh, uh, you know that's the process of locking on, and it's the time difference, right? The uh, the satellite the uh, receiver is generating the, the replica signal according to its clock, and then it's got the time given by the satellite clock, and that uh, and there's a time difference there at the receiver, and that's how it gets the uh, the distance to the satellite, right, from the, the difference in time, you know, how long it took the, uh, uh, how many nanoseconds it took for the uh, signal to, to at, at a particular timestamp to be transmitted to the receiver. And so that from each of those satellites, it can then draw the, uh, uh, the sphere around it and, um, uh, and get the location of the receiver. Now we can also get distance based on carrier phase. And this is where, um, you know, like the Nevada Geodetic Lab actually uses uh, the L2 broadcast and the precise code. Because we don't, you know, the, the codes that um, generate, the random uh, numbers that generate the precise code are top secret. Um, and you have to have a military uh, receiver uh, to, um, uh, to, to be able to unscramble those. And I'm sure they change them frequently and you got to go and uh, get your military receiver, you know, reset with the new codes. So, um, but there's still that carrier wave there, okay? And um, by tracking that carrier wave from each satellite globally with, with uh, stable ground stations, okay, we can start to predict, um, you know, groups like the Nevada Geodetic Lab can predict that carrier wave and actually uh, uh, begin to um, uh, be able to get the uh, uh, 
the distance from the satellites based on, on carrier phase. And this basically comes about by taking the, uh, uh, the reference signal generated by the, uh, um, you know, maybe uh, by a ground station or maybe mimicked by a uh, receiver. And then um, uh, adding that to the, uh, the, G the signal coming from the satellite. And then uh, you get a beat, a beat signal in, out of that. Uh, that's uh, actually much uh, much broader and easier to uh, to deal with, you know, because these these carrier waves are going by at a uh, you know one to two billion cycles per second. Okay, so if you can uh, identify which cycle you're on, are you on the tenth cycle or the or the fifth or whatever, that allows for about twenty centimeter accuracy. Okay. Um, you know, L1 has a wavelength of uh, 24.4 centimeters, L2 has a wavelength of 19 centimeters. And then if you can even get it finer, you know, each cycle has 360 degrees of phase. And if you can get it finer, then you can get a portion of that 24 centimeters uh, accuracy. Okay, so you can get to sub centimeter accuracy if you can, if you can, you know, get an estimate of the phase angle. So, um, you know, if you just had one, um, if you just had one uh, um, observ observation point, you know, no base station, and um, you didn't know which, uh, you didn't have a, a really good guess of which particular cycle is being broadcast, then, you know, there are, um, you know, thousands of different positions you could get, okay, even in, in you know, a tenth of a second's observations. But if you've got lots of ground stations to work against, if you've got, um, if you've got a local base station, you can demonstrate that one solution is, is the most probable. So it's a, it's a matter of, uh, uh, of bringing the, the, you know, the accurate solution to be the most probable. So, uh, uh, you know, how do we do that? Okay. So there's all kinds of strategies for resolving the ambiguities uh, by, you know, that are in the phase and getting that, uh, you know, centimeter, 10 centimeter to, uh, which is called decimeter, um, to sub-centimeter accuracy. If you keep your baseline short, if you have uh, a small distance from your roving receiver to your, um, to your uh, uh, base station receiver, uh, you use both the L1 and the L2 um, uh, frequencies. You've got to record them both. Uh, and you, uh, you observe as many epochs as possible. You collect as many of those phases, as many of those waveforms as possible. Okay. If you minimize multipathing by good uh, uh, site selection, also observing at night can help if you're doing really accurate work. And also you want to, of course, uh, observe as many satellites as possible. You know, you can get... Um, uh, you know, four is the minimum, of course, because uh, we got to get time and X, Y, and Z where the uh, receiver is. So you got four unknowns. That's so four satellites is minimum to have four equations uh, for the four unknowns. But the, um, uh, you know, if you can observe uh, 40 satellites, you know, including some of the Russian and European uh, constellation, um, then, um, uh, then you can, you can get a, a much better solution. Okay, so what about multipathing? Um, what that refers to is signal reflections from objects around the antenna. Like, uh, you know, you set up the antenna ne right next to your, uh, your vehicle, okay? Then there's gonna be reflections from the, the metal body of the vehicle um, uh, arriving at your antenna, as well as the direct uh, uh, signals from the satellite, okay? Um, if any of you remember uh, non-digital TV, this is uh, signal ghosting, okay? And, and it's poss very possible that a receiver can confuse the ghost with the direct signal and therefore get the travel time wrong, okay? And, and in addition to, you know, mislocating yourself and getting, getting the time solution bad, um, at, at, at the very minimum, you know, the quality of the data goes down. So you wanna, we wanna uh, reduce multipath so good site selection, okay. Remember the trouble we had uh, uh, in Manzi Nabol, uh, some of you were there, um, 
when we were trying to take um, uh, GPS points underneath the, uh, the trees, okay? Uh, buildings, rock faces, trees, uh, large vehicles, uh, those are characteristics of, uh, of poor sites. And um, you wanna, you wanna uh, get away from those. Uh, there's, a, there's a larger kind of antenna that you can use. Um, you haven't seen one of these. Uh, they cost a, a couple thousand dollars, I think. Um, but there are, there are a few of those around Mackey. Uh, it's called a choke ring antenna. And um, it's kind of a, a, a bullseye target sort of uh, aluminum, uh, machined, uh, carefully machined aluminum structure. And what that does is it stops reflections from the ground. It's about a foot wide. Uh, also, uh, the other thing you can do, for instance, if we'd been under the trees in Manzita Bull and we recorded for four hours, well, there'd be no problem, okay? What we wanted to do was, was be able to get an accurate elevation, you know, for use in gravity uh, in, um, in a lot less than four hours, you know, 15 minutes would be better. So uh, if you have a bad site, you can record for a longer period of time. Um, if there's truly a problem site uh, and, and, you know, what do you do in a, in, a, in a cave or a mine tunnel, okay? Well, you gotta survey that using an optical method. You can't get GPS in a, in a mine tunnel, all right? And of course, the, uh, the more advanced a GPS receiver uh, you have, uh, the better off you'll be. For instance, even our, our Trimble R10, uh, which is fairly new, but not, not brand new. Um, it only uses the, it only looks at the, uh, uh, the uh, US um, GPS constellation of satellites. Um, if, we could, if we could afford to buy a newer uh, version, it would also look at the, uh, the European and Russian and Chinese uh, satellites. Again, uh, once you, uh, you, you're looking at uh, carrier phase uh, uh, and the, the carrier frequencies, you don't care about the codes uh, and you're, uh, you're relying on um, you know, non-governmental um, sources uh, to give you the, the orbits of the satellites um, because they're, uh, you know, the, like the Nevada Geodetic Lab is, comes up daily with orbits for all, all the satellites. So you can have a, a more modern GPS receiver that can look at more satellites and um, additional constellations of satellites and thus um, get, uh, get a better solution. Okay, so how do you get this uh, sub-decimeter accuracy? Uh, and I'm talking about here um, uh, with uh, post-processing, okay? So here um, we, we are, uh, uh, we have, we set out a base station as uh, some classes have done. And, uh, and we record the whole time that we're roving around making uh, GPS measurements in the, in the field. Um, but there's no communication uh, between, the, um, uh, between, the, um, uh, between the, the two receivers, the base station and the rover, okay? So we just uh, uh, you know, strike the, uh, the base station and we bring both of them back to, uh, to the lab or to a computer. We download both of the receivers and their data uh, into a computer and either we can use a, a website or software uh, from the, uh, uh, the companies like uh, Trimble to, um, uh, to do the post-processing, all right? So, so there is that extra time. We don't get a solution while we're in the field, okay? Which means that while we're in the field, we don't know the quality of the solutions we're getting. We're just, you know, we made an educated guess about how long we should record given the conditions and some, it doesn't always work out. Uh, sometimes you have to go out and redeploy. Um, uh, there is one advantage. Um, you know, if you wait until the next day, you get a precise, a more precise ephemeris uh, from the uh, Nevada Geodetic Lab. What's an ephemeris? An ephemeris is basically a satellite orbit equation. Okay, so you know, from the day before, uh, the Nevada Geodetic Lab will be monitoring every satellite um, around the world and bring the data back. And over the, overnight, um, they, uh, they process it and they release uh, updated orbits for all the satellites and all the constellations. 
And if you use that um, uh, the next day, if you're willing to wait that day, then you can actually get better results. Okay. So um, uh, when you're doing, when you have uh, less than 10 kilometers between your, your, um, your rover and your, your base station, so we'll call that short baseline differential GPS, you can get an accuracy between uh, one and 30 centimeters in uh, X, Y, and Z. You know, usually Z is, or not Z, but elevation is, is, uh, is less accurate. And it depends on, you know, how long you occupied each station, it depends on the length of the baseline and it depends on processing methods, just like, you know, are you willing to wait for the ephemeris? Um, so here's an exam, here's a couple examples of the kind of accuracy you can get, okay? If you observe, if you have a 10 kilometer baseline, if you're 10 kilometers away from your, your base station uh, and you post process uh, and you observed each roving point for 15 minutes, you know, in general, you can get uh, three sigma um, accuracy, 99% uh, accuracy of 15 centimeters uh, with that 15 minutes of observation. If you need to go down to two centimeters accuracy, then that's gonna take several hours, all right? So uh, it's a trade-off between the accuracy you get and the, um, uh, and the speed that you can survey. Hey, Dr. Louis, though, maybe, yeah. We, we should mention that I, I think you're talking about um, an acquisition plan here that would deal with post-processing, but- Exactly, yes. Okay, but if it's more common for people to use uh, RTK, that's real-time kinetic, and, and so that's what like, say, gravity operators are gonna use. I had mentioned how you, you've right. seen some pictures too where the GPS antenna is attached to the pack and their occupation time is as long as it takes for them to read the gravity station, which is like two to three minutes, and you can get within- Much more efficient. Two centimeters, yeah. So just, to, I just didn't want anybody to think that, uh, you know, you've got to wait 15 minutes or, or two hours for every single measurement. Um, this so is so only when, we, when we could not afford the RTX subscription from Trimble, which is not that many years ago, um, uh, we had to use uh, post-processing, and that's when we had the 15 minutes. That, uh, that RTX subscription is costing us $2,400 a year. Uh, and the other way around that, with, to use RTK strictly, um, is um, uh, to set up a radio between the, um, um, between the, the a radio link uh, between the base station and the, uh, um, uh, and the rover. And then maintaining that radio link turns out to be, you know, you got to have a whole crew dedicated to that uh, quite often. The radio link is what's most likely to fail you. So, uh, yeah, these are uh, uh, th there are several ways of getting this accurate GPS. And that radio link, that is the real time part in the RTK, right. real-time real -time kinematic. kinematic because it's taken the base station information and applying a timing correction in real time to the rover. So you can see on the screen of the GPS what your vertical, uh, horizontal and vertical resolution is in real time because the correction signal is coming um, from the base station. I think that's because of delays, uh, refraction in the ionosphere. Yeah, there's, there's uh, all kinds of ionosphere, there's, there's uh, delays due to water vapor, clouds. Mm -hmm. um, there's all sorts of sources. Um, so by having the base station just sitting in one place all day, uh, that is, uh, or at least for a long period of time, like hour, two hours, that is the way to characterize that de those delays and then apply a correction that is a broadcast in real time. And that's how uh, you can get, you know, within two centimeters or a couple of centimeters uh, with a 60, a one to two minute occupation. Yeah, and, and you know, that relies on the rovers and the, the rover and the, the, the base station being less than 10 kilometers apart. Now, what happens if you have what's called a long baseline, okay? Now here again, I'm, I'm just, I'm not talking about RT, uh, real time. I'm talking about um, 
uh, post-processing differential GPS. So uh, to get that accuracy of one to 30 centimeters, okay, um, the examples here are uh, plus or minus 15 centimeters requires two hours of observation. Just because you're, you're you know, not, not having your, uh, your base station close enough. And to get down to one centimeter level requires several days of recording. So, you know, only surveyors putting out baselines are going to be doing that. It's not practical for gravity. Okay, now, now you can just uh, get uh, base station data from the internet. That's, that's essentially, I believe, what RTX, the RTX service does. And um, so you want to be close. You know, it's going to work really well when you're close enough to a base station. Here's a, a map of base stations uh, that are maintained by, uh, by various groups and available over the internet. Hopefully there's more now, uh, but I don't know if the situation in Nevada is much different. Um, and here's a, um, a map, a, a, a close-up essentially of that map, the national cores. Um, and uh, uh, we have several stations in uh, the Reno area. Uh, but if you look, look over here, that's Elko County. And Elko County is not near to any base stations, which means that um, uh, you know, each mining company is going to be uh, operating their own base station because they, you know, they rely on GPS just as much as everybody else. So, um, um, uh, and, and the, ma the major mining companies do operate their own network of, um, um, of, uh, of GPS base stations continuously operated and, and they, uh, you know, they have to pay for the whole thing and so they don't share it with anybody else. Uh, we're lucky in, uh, in Washoe County, okay, which is a long, you know, north-south narrow county right there. Uh, there's base stations, there's a, a base station in, um, uh, 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 what's that town um, by the Black Rock Desert? Gerlach. Thank you. Yeah, there's a base station in Gerlach, and there's another base station up in the Sheldon Wildlife Refuge, and they're on the internet, so you can use them. Um, so you're, you're not, if, as long as you're in Washoe County, uh, you're never very far away from a base station, which is pretty amazing. Uh, it's Elko County that, that suffers. Um, now, if you're in Southern Washoe County in the Reno Sparks area, there are several base stations that have been operating for some years. And, um, and so, you know, where most of the building is in, uh, in, in, uh, Washoe County, you're within, uh, uh, you're within 10 kilometers of a base station, no problem. But if you're outside these circles, okay, you're probably going to want to either use a, uh, uh, the, G, the, the RTX uh, service from Trimble, which costs about $2,500 a year, or you're going to want to um, set up your own base station, which means you have to have a second uh, GPS receiver. Okay, just a, a, a couple quick notes about the... Uh, about what we mean by elevation, okay? And there's, uh, there's three different concepts which you might have heard about in a, uh, another class, uh, at least for you geophysicists. Um, but um, it turns out that uh, uh, there's different models of, the, um, uh, of what the elevation means and you kind of have to look at the terminology and um, uh, and figure out what you're, what you're looking at, okay? There's the elevation above sea level, which is called the orthometric height, okay? And then there's the, um, uh, the ellipsoidal height, okay? So that's the height above the ellipsoid model. And then there's the geoid separation model, which tells you how different the geoid is from the ellipsoid, okay? The ellipsoid is, a, is an ellipse, ellipse of, uh, ellipsoid of revolution, you know, which has the uh, equatorial bulge, um, but it doesn't vary with, uh, it only varies with latitude. Um, you know, the distance from the center of the earth only varies with latitude, doesn't vary with longitude. So it's kind of a, a, a one dimensional kind of, uh, it's a very simple model, okay? The geoid is, is what it is um, and, um, and it is, uh, um, 
it is the um, uh, uh, it, it varies with you know depending on exactly where you are. Okay, uh, it has to do with density, uh, um, uh, different densities in the uh, um, uh, in the mantle and crust. Uh, so the orthometric height, which is what you want, it's going to be the ellipsoidal height plus the geoid separation. All right. Uh, the ellipsoidal height is the height above a selected ellipsoid. Okay. Now, um, and I th believe this is still true. Uh, GPS always uses the WGS84 ellipsoid. Okay. Which is not what Washoe County or the city of Reno used to, uh, uh, to give locations in, or the, uh, Bureau, the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology. They use different ellipsoids, okay? Uh, and your GPS, so your GPS has to con be convert, your GPS location and height has to be converted to the WGS80, or, or away from the WGS84 uh, ellipsoid to whatever ellipsoid you're using. So uh, GPS output heights are above that WGS84 ellipsoid. Uh, now, this is interesting. In Reno, the GPS elevations are, because of that, 24 meters less than the topo map elevations. And that's due to the geoid separation. So the geoid separation is uh, 24 meters, uh, a negative 24 meters uh, in Reno. So the geoid is the actual um, potential surface, equipotential surface of the earth. And it tends to match mean sea level. If you dug canals at sea level through the continents, okay, the geoid surface would be the level of the water in those canals. A geoid separation or really an undulation in the geoid model gives, a, gives an estimate of how high the geoid is above or below the reference ellipsoid. And there's a, a bunch of, uh, of standard models. Uh, they get updated uh, fairly frequently. They can actually change substantially when there's a giant earthquake like um, the one in Indonesia um, you know, there, or, or uh, northern Japan. When there's a magnitude uh, uh, eight to nine earthquake, these geoid models can actually change because those earthquakes are actually rearranging density uh, in the mantle. Uh, okay, so in Reno, the geoid surface is about 24 meters below the ellipsoid of WGS84. And here's a map of that geoid surface uh, across the United States and uh, Canada and Mexico, parts of them. Um, and you can see the, um, the Sierra Nevada. You can, see the, um, uh, you can see a lot of mountain ranges. You can also see things that are not mountain ranges, like the mid-continent rift. Okay, you can see gravity anomalies in the geoid model. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. Okay, I need to move on to the questions. I've got five questions I'm trying to get through here. So let's give each one in a minute or so. Okay, so the, um, uh, the first one is, uh, it's question 18-2 on carrier phase ambiguity resolution. Which strategy will not help you get more accurate carrier phase data with less phase ambiguity? A, keeping baseline short. B, recording just one frequency, L1 or L2. C, recording for enough time to have many epochs. D, recording as many satellites as possible. Uh, so if you could send uh, your, um, uh, your A, B, C, or D to uh, Kellen um, as a private message, or you can uh, certainly you can send it as a uh, as a message to all if you want. And Kellen will will tell me. Uh, let's give him a minute. All right. Well, the bees have it. Thank you very much. Uh, you guys were paying attention. Um, you know, basically uh, anything that gets you more data. Um, will uh, will help you with carrier phase ambiguity resolution. Um, so keeping baseline short does that. Um, uh, recording for more time, okay, does that. Recording more satellites helps, okay. 
So the answer is not A, C, or D. So uh, by if you only record one of the two frequencies, L1 or L2, then you're, you're ignoring half the data you could get. And so that's not going to help you. All right. Multipathing. Which environment will likely have the most problems with multipathing? A, near the ocean surface. B, heavily urbanized sites. C, on a clay playa. D, heavily mineralized sites. Yeah, again, the bees have it, okay? In heavily urbanized sites, you're gonna get interference from vehicles um, and buildings, okay? If I had put uh, heavily forested sites in here, right, that would have been confusing. Um, so, it, you know, the, the, the thing I tried to confuse you with was, um, you know, the ocean water is conductive, the clay playa is conductive, heavily mineralized sites can be conductive, and those can cause uh, reflections of the GPS uh, signals at the, from the surface. Uh, but certainly if you have a choke ring antenna um, and you, you properly use it, uh, that those won't matter so much. Uh, but even a choke ring a antenna has problems in, in, you know, like right next to a, a, the wall of a building. Chris, were you saying? Yeah, I just wanted to add, uh, you know, and if you were, if you were unsure, hey, how, how accurate are these measurements? You know, how do we know if there's a problem here? Well, that's where those repeats come in. And, you know, that's why you do it for gravity. We talked about the repeat table of not only right. the gravity, but the elevation too. So that's how you could check is, you know, come back the next day or an hour later and measure it again or measure a couple points again, some percentage of your overall total to try to give you confidence or, uh, or you know, evaluate what the, what yeah, the you'll have was. You'll have different satellites in different directions. Um, the ionosphere will be different. And if you get the same elevation, then you, then you can know things are working quite well. Okay. Um, the DGPS, differential GPS baseline length. At South Tahoe, this is in 2012, the class measured each survey point for two to 10 minutes. For decimeter elevation accuracy, how far away could continuously recording GPS base stations, which we could get on the internet, how far away could those be from our survey points? A, less than 200 kilometers, B, less than 20 kilometers, C, less than 10 kilometers, D, less than one kilometer. Let's give that a minute. Yeah, uh, uh, we never mentioned, um, you know, getting to be, um, uh, you know, base station separations of less than a kilometer. It's probably a matter of diminishing returns, right? Um, you could put your base station that close, but uh, you may not do much better. But there is a noticeable difference between having your base station less than 10 kilometers away and having your base station between 10 and 20 kilometers away. Um, and what we were saying is we're getting just decimeter elevation accuracy. I mean, not better, but just decimeter, okay, 10 centimeters elevation accuracy um, for, you know, under two minutes of, under 10 minutes of observation. So that's got to be uh, closer than uh, 10 kilometers, and which is in fact what we did in, in South Tahoe. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Question 19-1, the reference station network. Which area is most isolated from the GPS reference station network? A, Southern Washoe County, B, South Lake Tahoe, C, Elko County, D, Northern Washoe County. Yeah. No, uh, um, amazingly, uh, you know, with the, the stations at uh, Gerlach and at, uh, which I think, let's see, the Gerlach station is maintained by either the state of Nevada or Washoe County. And then somebody else maintains the uh, base station at, um, at Sheldon. Uh, with both of those, amazingly enough, Washoe County is quite well covered. Um, it's Elko County 
that uh, is not covered, and that's why C is the right answer. Um, Southern Washoe County and South Lake Tahoe, they, they both have a lot of, um, you know, there's Placer County stations in Tahoe, there's, there's um, Washoe County stations in, in uh, Southern Washoe County. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, got to gotta call, uh, uh, call Monson and see if this is still true of Elko County. All right, don't want to ask that question or that one. Last question here on the geoid. And, and let's, let's give them, um, you know, uh, yeah, we got enough time for this one. They're going to have to think about this one a bit. Um, 19.4 on the geoid. Above a substantial density concentration in the crust or mantle, such as a seamount, or a dense subducting slab, the geoid surface is usually A, depressed and lower than the ellipsoid, B, basically the same. Density has little effect on the geoid. C, raised and higher than the ellipsoid. D, not enough info to tell. All right, well, these guys are definitely paying attention because C is the answer. The, uh, the density concentration, the extra density in the seamount or the subducting slab, um, basically attracts the ocean surface and raises a, uh, a bump in the geoid that sticks up higher than the ellipsoid. Um, it's, it helps to remember that the, the geoid is, is like the ocean surface. It's not a, um, you know, it doesn't, it's not a, a, an elastic plate that gets pulled down by the, um, uh, by the, uh, uh, the extra density, it's, a uh, it's an, being an equal potential surface, it's, um, um, it's got, uh, uh, high, um, it, it attracts, uh, the ocean to it. So that's why the answer is C.